So we look, uh, I, I wanted to talk about using something along the lines of uh, game theory, uh, which is if the U.S. is $14 trillion, if you look at that as 14 chips, we're taking two or three of our chips just on health care, uh, two of those chips just on uh, military. So now we have, um, let's say, nine chips left. Uh, one and a half of the chips goes to corporate profits and CEO bonuses. So now we've got seven and a half chips left. Um, and if you played a game where you gave these trillion chips along with a growth rate every year, you get more like when you play a game like Risk or Monopoly, you'll see that what you really want to do is you want to invest in your economic engine because we're actually living in a time of peace. We don't have a Cold War with the Soviet Union. Uh, this business about Islamic extremism is a, is a real red herring. It's a very tiny military threat. If you removed all of this extra security uh, and you look at the cost of it, it's probably around $100 million per life that you think you're saving. Plus, you may actually be provoking the problem. So we aren't in a position uh, where we can play this arrogant role anymore. Look at these factors. How are you, Mitt Romney and uh, Newt Gingrich and uh, Rick Santorum? How are you going to deal with this and maintain this large military? Uh, please explain to me what benefit it has to us. We need to develop manufacturing, science, and, and culture. I want a big magnet of countries for trade is their culture. So, for example, in the uh, 50s and 60s and during the Cold War, our culture was a real magnet, and it still is. Um, but uh, our culture uh, is pretty thin soup intellectually uh, compared to what it was. Um, I'm quoting actually Hugh Hefner here which uh, you know you may not like, but he interviewed a lot of people over the decades and years. Uh, the, so here are my questions for the candidates. Wealth concentration. Um, if you look at trend lines, you'll see that uh, the top are getting more and more and more of the pie and have been for a long time. And so how does that happen? So if you look, for example, in my industry, I'm in broadband fixed wireless. Uh, we own virtually no spectrum at my company, no licenses for frequencies. Uh, we have a few little tiny ones for just going from point A to point B, not like a cellular coverage because they're fantastically expensive. But once you've got those spectrum licenses, you can make enormous amounts of money. So Verizon makes a billion dollars every three months. So once you have a dominant quasi-monopoly position, you are able to make a fantastic amount of money, and that money can be funneled to a very small group of people. As an example, then there's the issue of corruption of the revolving door between industry and lobbyists and the military-industrial complex, which Eisenhower warned us. So how does freeing up public sector money actually translate into improved health education and uh, small business growth and so forth? And uh, my second question is, why do we have more prisoners in any other country? Why do we spend more on crime than any other country? I don't believe Americans are more predisposed to crime than other people by 400%. And why have we effectively given away all the rights that we've worked for for 400 years since we first arrived here uh, to protect us against small bands of extremists? Uh, uh, which aren't any greater a threat than we've had certainly since the 1960s. In the 1960s, we had nine or ten different uh, revolutionary armed groups just in the Bay Area alone. Um, and why, why do politicians want to uh, betray us by selling our liberties? Why would these people want to continue to take away liberties? What if uh, uh, the founders warned us of this unchecked power of government? And what if an unscrupulous leader gets into power and wants to use these emergency law powers to um, do something horrendous to us? That was what the founders designed the system to prevent to do. We've removed that balance, that equilibrium. And uh, why do we suppose that couldn't happen here, that we get something like uh, Hitler or a Stalin who appears benevolent at first but starts putting the screws in? Uh, why do we assume that that can't happen here? 
And uh, how does having a military-related debt equal to our entire K-12 education system make us safer? And if we can concede that non-wealth creating expenditures, things that do not feed people, sap our strength as a nation, and Eisenhower said that every time you, you hire a soldier, you're taking food off the table of people. Why wouldn't we first draw down, build up our economic power, and then consider projecting U.S. military power? And will we not ultimately be defeated militarily if we misallocate our resources? Um, so we have to look at workforce skill, research and development, education, health, and poverty, and all of these are leading in the wrong direction. And that's about it, okay? Thank you very much.